Our final reading is Mark 10, 2 through 16. And the Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He assessed them. What did Moses command you? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate for a divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. They were bringing children to him that he might touch them. The disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon him. The word of the Lord. (laughs) What is an armchair theologian? supposed to do with today's readings. Job, the meaning of suffering. Is there really a meaning to suffering? Is this a question we can even answer? Job comes from a time when before Satan was the devil. Satan and uh, and God communicated. But it seemingly flies in the face of our modern concept of a God of grace and mercy. Preach on our psalm. The psalmist actually invites God, prove me, O Lord, try me, test my heart and mind. Not needed, I failed. You don't need to test me, Lord. I failed. I prefer not to be tested. Do you want tested? I don't want tested. And then, of course, the famous, let no man separate what God has joined. Really? How do we, or me, an armchair theologian, reconcile this with our modern society? Does God really want a bunch of miserable people running around? And how does this reading tie into Job? Is the lectionary comparing the suffering of a loveless marriage to Job's suffering? I should have pitched the lectionary a long time ago. But I am a stubborn fool, as you all know, and I readily admit that. And so I soldiered on in the patience of Job, because Job did indeed suffer. But most interestingly, he suffered because God pointed him out to Satan and then gave Satan the go-ahead to exact the suffering on a true servant. God says there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, the God of grace and mercy, our New Testament God, allowed a family to be killed for what purpose? Prove a point? This Old Testament God is really tough to wrap our head around. Satan comes, causes Job to lose his possessions, his children, and then what's Job do? He worships. What does he say? Naked I come from the womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job is certainly more upright and blameless than I. I'm not sure that's something I could have said or prayed or done. But for this piety, this not forsaking the Lord, 
Satan says, ah, but if we actually heard him, he will forsake you. So for this piety, Job gets sores over his entire body. The book of Job continues as a debate between his friends and Job. They're trying to understand his suffering. His friends believe he did something wrong. Therefore, God is punishing him. That is not my vision of God. And that was not Job's. Job knew himself to be blameless, and he said, oh, I'm blameless. But that did not, did not keep him from asking why. God answers Job's question by saying, were you there to creation? Can you understand the size and complexity of the earth? How do you expect to understand my ways? You, a mortal man. Job couldn't, and neither can I. But Job did accept his inability to understand. That is something I struggle with. And I really struggle with the ending of Job, which is, oh, by the way, you get twice as many animals as you had to get a new family and to get to live 140 years. So maybe a year of suffering was worth it. Who knows? This is where I run into a problem with my vision of God. You see, there's a Christian theologian named Thomas Merton. He was a Trappist monk. He wrote, Our idea of God tells us more about ourselves than about God. I am a pragmatic guy, therefore my version of God is pragmatic. I am not unsympathetic, but I am a buck up and quit your whining kind of guy. Therefore, my version of God is a buck up, quit your whining kind of God. I am a gruff, but fundamentally kind. I do not wish on harm or ill to befall anyone. And the God of Job diverges from my idea of a kind God. Our ego bends our interpretation to what God does and what God controls and how God interacts in our life. A good, ver a good example of this is our version of heaven. I happen to know that Patty's version of heaven is flying free, exploring worlds, new lights, new experiences, no pain, no suffering. That's a pie in the sky version of heaven, from my perspective. My version, and Bob's version of heaven, is sleep. <laughs> we die, we sleep. We get woken up at the second coming. Same church, same Bible, same God. Totally different interpretations and feelings. These visions are formed not by theology, but by our experiences, our joys, and our travails. So, this was, my sermon went off the rails at this point. There's a lot going on, there's a lot of stress, a lot of thinking going on. And I had written a sermon and I wasn't happy with it. And so I chucked it all last night at 10 o'clock, started over. So what you're about to hear was finished about 40 minutes ago. Well, more than 40 minutes ago, 55 minutes ago. I, have, I, I can't decide if it makes sense. I can't decide if it's appropriate. I can't decide a lot of things, but it does speak to where I am at. We will from a, the patience of Job to a meditation of ego. I went to a meeting last week involving a group of veterinarians I'm, I'm with, all independent business owners. There's 20 of them in our group. There's about 1,500 in the whole group. And everybody was going around, you know, oh, this COVID is bad, it's doing this, it's doing that, it's tearing, you know, it's uh, 
hard, the clients are unhappy, blah, and it went on and on and on, and they come to me and I'm like, life's good. <laughs> life's good. I got no stress. I got the team I've always dreamed of. We can't keep everybody happy, and we understand that, but we can accept that. And then we had two positive COVID cases, which means, because I'm health commissioner, we actually follow the rules. You can't be a health commissioner and expect other people to follow the rules if you don't follow them yourself. So I sent all the unvaccinated people home. For, the rules are seven days, but by the time we found out we had a confirmed positive, it would ended up being two days plus a weekend. So the meeting was over on Saturday and I decided to stay a couple extra days and do some birding. Because even though I really do have a good life and have no stress, it never hurts to have even less stress if possible. So I drove to Corpus Christi because of the hawk migration where 50 or 100,000 hawks will fly over your head in a day. And unfortunately, I spent all three days trying to hold my team together. And by the time I got back from Texas, I had two teams. Team vaccinated and team unvaccinated. So there you go. From the team of my dreams to two teams. Team vaccinated is a little resentful that they had to run the clinic short seven people. That's certainly understandable. One is fearful because she doesn't want to take it home to her elderly parents and developmentally delayed nephew. One is concerned for her unborn child. One is concerned for her toddler. Fear, as we all know, is a potent motivator. It's a potent separator, too. Team unvaccinated is hurt and mad. They were told team vaccinated said they hope they get it to teach them a lesson. Now, listen folks, I have spent a lifetime working on patients that cannot speak to me. My, I can read their mind as much as one can read the mind of that sort of patient. I do not need my staff to talk to know what they're thinking. I have spent a lifetime questioning people to get the truth out of them when they A, don't know the truth, don't understand what's important, what's not important. I am a master of communication. I can tell you I'm skeptical that any of the staff would have said, I hope they get it to teach them a lesson. But I say to Team Unvaccinated, if this occurred, it came from fear. And you expect them to respect your fear of vaccination, but do you respect their fear? Remember, fear is a potent motivator and a potent separator. So after some questioning, of course, no one actually said, I hope they get sick to teach them a lesson. It's kind of like Patty and I's version of heaven. You interpret what is said to you based on the mood you're in. If you're in a combative mood, good morning would be like, you tell me good morning? It depends on where your head's at. So, It goes through five people. This is essentially the parlor game telephone. Do you guys ever play that? You line up 20 people and you say a sentence and see what it sounds like when you get to the other end. It is never, ever, ever the way it started. And to be quite honest with you, it, it feels like I'm dealing with grade school or some day. I had lived that, so hopefully they're not watching. Um, but at any rate, this is what I explained to Team Unvaccinated. I explained to both teams that 
you have to inhabit somebody's fear to understand where they're coming from. So, how did my wise King Solomon moment work out? That's what you're wondering. <laughs> we shall see, but I fear it didn't work out very well. More importantly, how does this tie into this message? That's what you're wondering. You're like, where's this guy? What's this guy doing up here? This is what's on my mind. And when you read the Bible, you're reading these passages, it speaks to you in strange and funny ways. And something compelled me to chuck an entire sermon last night. We are all in some ways suffering. Tempers are getting short. And personally, the patience of Job is waning in me personally. Part of the problem is dealing with some of these folks, many of them, is the danger of looking at yourself as a completed. God created us, we're fully formed, we're ready to serve, finished product. Just put us in the microwave, heat us up, everything be good. When I asked them, do you respect their fear, that was not even a question they'd ever even considered. Can you forgive and move on? That is not something they're contemplating. Why? I argued all they have heard the term to pay, although they've heard the term of patience of Job, they have no idea where it actually comes from. They do not understand. The way I think this way is because on my journey to or with or for God, I have tried mightily to learn to make my ego, ego subservient to God's will. And as you know from previous sermons, it doesn't go very good on some days. I am still a willful and stubborn servant. This is a work in progress. But it is progress, and you do not find progress on Facebook. I don't care how long you spend on Facebook. You're not going to find any progress on Facebook. You're going to find people think exactly like you, that amplify what you think, what you do. And what you're going to find might not even be true. You don't find progress in, face, in Facebook. You find progress by looking in. By opening up your head and your chest, looking at your heart, you find progress in prayer. You find progress by taking the morsels God feeds us in the form of a sentence in this very sermon, maybe. Or a passage that hits you the right way at the right time. Or a random act of connection. And most importantly, you find progress in the intentional act of forgiveness. Passing the peace of Christ is where the rubber meets the road. It's the hardest thing we are asked to do. So, Job did not accept his suffering, just accept it. He debated his suffering. He didn't understand it. He, he knew he was blameless. He tried to understand God's ways. He practiced what psychologists now call contemplative suffering. In order to grow from suffering adversity or adversity, it helps to prayerfully contemplate it. Do you think the two teams can contemplate the other's suffering? Naked we come in, naked we leave. To have this kind of insight requires you to at least tuck in your ego. And every time you manage to do that, you may just may become a little more like the person God hopes you become. When my mother was ill, I told you this was a rambling sermon. When my mother was ill, she had run with crash she, that she died at home. 
She had six sons, no daughters. We took care of her by taking shifts for eight months. I took Tuesday, Wednesday, Patrick took, or wait, I took Monday, Tuesday, Patrick took Thursday, Friday. My brother Kevin or Abe would come in for Friday, Saturday from Columbus. My brother BJ took care of all the logistics because he just wasn't capable of taking care of my mother like she needed to take care of. We did that for eight months. And one time she was talking to a friend and her, her friends asked her, what's it like to have your grown sons help you to the toilet and clean you and take care of you? I mean, can you imagine that? To this day, her reply was one of those profound and enlightening morsels from God. She said, one of the things cancer takes from you is your ego and your modesty. That is contemplative suffering. My mother was a gagger. If she smelled a smell, she would gag. You'd be walking down, something would switch, you'd go, and you'd be like, Ee. So, unfortunately, I inherited that trait. I mean, I know that's hard to believe. I stick my arm up the rear end of cows for a living and all that sort of thing. But I didn't inherit that trait when it comes to touching people. I mean, it's, you guys are gross, no offense. I mean, Biz, if you drop, I'm your man. I'll save you, big guy, but do not be offended when I go home and disinfect myself, okay? But I will step up to the plate. My mother, invariably at three in the morning, would say I have to go to the bathroom. I would say, the nurse is coming in four hours, can't you wait? <laughs> this is a true story. I'm speaking the truth. The Lord will tell you I'm speaking the truth. Which she would laugh, of course, and of course I'd help her. So I would get everything ready, get her situated, and I would leave the room. And then, of course, you know, I'm a large animal vet, right? So I got long sleeves, long sleeves, two gloves, Vicks, a mask. I'm done. Open the door. What do I do? <laughs> you okay? <laughs> Mom? I'm coming. <laughs> I'll be right <laughs> there. <laughs> Mom? <laughs> She laughed like she wasn't sick. And the whole time she was laughing, saying, I am so sorry you inherited my gagger. And I would say, you're laughing too hard to be truly sorry. <laughs> but I did it. And I can tell you for a fact, the one thing love takes from you is ego. To serve, you have to put your ego in your back pocket. That was the best and worst eight months of my entire life, and I'll never forget it. It is easy to be a good person or a good Christian when life is good. There's no Jobian patience required. But... When we are immersed in the fire of suffering, it requires serious contemplation to see the light of God, to see the reason these things occur when there's probably really no reason. And the first thing you have to understand, the first thing my team has to understand is suffering is relative. Surely someone with a painful cancer suffers more than someone worried about vaccine side effects. The philosophers will tell you those are different kinds of suffering. The one is a natural suffering caused by natural processes. The other is a moral suffering caused by living in this complex world with other complex emotional human beings. But from the sufferer's perspective, it's suffering. God told Job, you cannot understand my ways. And Job admitted he couldn't, but he did accept his inability to understand. 
I cannot understand my staff's fears. But I can accept the reality. I can at least, at least put my ego in my back pocket long enough to listen. I mentioned Tom and Smerton earlier. I'm a little bit on a, a Merton kick. And so I've got two other quotes from him. So this one says, I cannot treat other men as men unless I have compassion for them. I must have at least enough compassion to realize that when they suffer, they feel somewhat as I do when I suffer. And for some reason, and if for some reason I do not spontaneously feel this kind of sympathies for other, then it is God's will that I do what I can do to learn how. Remember earlier, people think they're a prepackaged meal? You're not. You have to learn how to listen. You have to learn how to interpret. You have to learn how to inhabit someone else's fears. We are being asked to contemplate suffering through another's eyes. The patience of Job. Can you contemplate Job's suffering? I can't. It's beyond my ability to contemplate what Job went through. But I'm trying to learn. Peace, true peace, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is only found through suffering. We must seek the light in the darkness because we are all going to face darkness. We must recognize our weakness and our pain to see and empathize with others' weaknesses and others' pain. That, my friend, is the ex exercises, exercise of practicing Jobian patience without the benefit of suffering Jobian, or without the benefit of Jobian suffering. Surely we do not need to lose everything to find peace, patience, or understanding. Surely we don't need to be tested as the psalmist requested. Or do we? I don't know that. I told you this is a rumination. And it's going to end, and I don't have an answer. Of course, all this bloviating. Bloviating is like a good word. It means to talk about at length in an inflated or empty way. So all my bloviating up here does not solve the problem. For you and me, theology, ethics, compassion, understanding all run up against the hard, cold reality of living life and running a business. What does it mean for me when our psalmist, psalmist says, I shall walk in my integrity. My foot stands upon level ground. I can tell you King Solomon had an epiphanous moment on his hike Friday. I decided the larger you get, the harder the decisions are. And in turn, the more ruthless they must become. There is no way to satisfy 18 employees. It's all I am. I will have one team. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that I won't emotionally suffer. It doesn't mean they won't emotionally suffer. It doesn't mean my, cli my, my clients may not suffer in services. It means that I will have, with the patience of Job, tuck my ego in, my pocket and prayerfully and with sincerity contemplated my decisions. I hope the God of grace and mercy looks down upon me at this, during this process and shows me some light. I will pray Thomas Merton's famous prayer. I have no idea where I'm going, but I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. Amen.